Praise God. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Wonderful. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the fire of God. Amen. It's not a subject I've heard much of. Um, over the years, I've heard it um, mentioned various forms, various ways. Let me just get into my computer. Okay, the fire of God in the Bible. Let's have a look at um, what that actually means. How many kinds of fire are mentioned in the Bible? And uh, what do these reference to fire mean? Um, I'm not going to be able to cover all of this today, but uh, I'll give you an overview, and then we'll go into one or two parts of this um, you know, in more depth. Well, of course, there's the fire of judgment. And um, literally hundreds of scriptures about fire. Most of them are about the fire of judgment. And so at one point, we're going to have to look at that if we're going to deal with this subject effectively. Um, there's, an, there's another fire, the fire of cleansing. And then there's a third one, the fire is a manifestation of God himself. And we'll hopefully get time to look at that. Uh, fire in the Bible, that's protective. Um, I discovered there's a protective fire in the Bible. There's a fire for the ministers of God. Um, now, don't misunderstand me. Um, the Bible says we're all ministers of the new covenant. All right? It's not just for the clergy or for the, you know, for the pastors and so on. That's the ministers. The fire is for all the ministers um, of, of the new covenant. That's everybody that knows Jesus. Uh, the word of God is the fire. And uh, there's a fire that burns up the sacrifice in the Bible. And then there's a strange fire mentioned in the Bible. And then there's a fire that's demonic. Okay, so this is, this is we're going to go read some scripture to you um, from Matthew chapter 3. If you have a Bible, you want to turn to it or you want to do it on your phone or whatever. Matthew chapter 3. Um, in those days there appeared John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness, the desert of Judea, and saying, repent, think differently, change your mind, regretting your sins and changing your conduct, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is he who was mentioned by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, shouting in the desert, prepare the road for the Lord, make his highways straight, level, direct. This same John's garments were made of camel's hair and he wore a leather girdle around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the country around about the Jordan went out to him and they were baptized in the Jordan by him, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee and escape from the wrath and indignation of God against disobedience that is coming? Bring forth fruit that is consistent with repentance. Let your lives prove your change of heart. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our forefather. For I tell you, God is able to raise up descendants for Abraham from these stones. And already the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit, or does not bear good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. Amen. Okay, so we, we're actually um, looking here at this particular scripture. In the scripture, I'm just going to go down and finish it. The winnowing, his winnowing, hang on, let me see if I got that right. 10, where's 11? Okay. Okay, anyway, John is speaking and he said, Jesus, there is one coming in verse 11 who is greater than I. And he said, he's coming to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then in verse 12, he says, his winnowing fan, shovel, is in his hand. He said, I indeed baptize you with water because of repentance. This is because of your changing your minds for the better heartily amending your ways with abhorrence of your past sins. Uh, here it is. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, 
whose sandals I'm not worthy or fit to take off or carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His fork is in his hand and he will thoroughly clear out and clean and clear, thoroughly clear out and cleanse his threshing floor and gather store and store his wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn up with fire that cannot be put out. Okay, so we've got verse 10 and verse 12. There's two fires actually mentioned there. One is the fire of judgment in verse 10. It said, if the tree doesn't bear fruit, good fruit, then it's actually going to be plucked up and it will be burnt. And so that's a fruit, really, that's, that's, the, that's the fire of judgment. And uh, we'll look at that a bit more in depth, but the fire of judgment, when you're looking at the fire of judgment, is an amazingly interesting subject. It isn't a popular subject in the modernistic, westernized world, but it is in the Bible, and it has to be looked at and addressed. Okay, the second fire there, which is in verse 12, talking about Jesus, John talking about Jesus, is the fire for cleansing. Okay, anybody need to be cleansed? Anybody need to uh, receive the fire to have any bur dross burn up? Any rubbish burn up? Any things in us that hinder the growth, hinder the fruit? And so there is a fire available from God by Jesus himself to burn up that, fire, to burn up that, uh, that dross, to burn up that rubbish. And I think that's very, very um, a good one to look at in a moment. Okay, the fire of judgment um, is the most common fire mentioned in the Bible. As a, it's a common place in ancient Israel, fire obviously is to be taken literally in most of the several hundred references in the Bible. Its, it's figurative or theological attestations are also numerous, however generally relating to some manifestation of, God's, of God being, God's being or action. Amen. I'm going to read something to you. This is, this is, again, we're on the fire of judgment for the moment. Revelation 20. It says, and we'll go to, de this is the um, Satan, we'll go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog. Two cities in Russia. Gog and Magog. And it says that the nation from the north will come down in the future against Israel with a big army from different nations. Gog and Magog, Magog to assemble them for battle. That Their number is like the sand of the seashore. That's those going down against Israel. And they marched across the broad expanse of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. That's Jerusalem. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them that's deceived the people, the armies going down against Israel. The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, into which the beast and the false prophet had already been thrown. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay, so we, we actually have a fire mentioned here, the fire of judgment, which came down from heaven... And it said it actually destroyed the armies that were coming against Jerusalem. This is futuristic. It hasn't happened yet. And so we have the Battle of Armageddon, which is coming. This is an end-time battle, which will happen in Israel, in, in, the, in the plain of Megiddo. Megiddo, happening in Megiddo. So we have this happening in the future. So we see there is a fire that comes down from heaven. If we're looking to the, the Bible, there is a, a prophet, um, Elijah. Just trying to think, is Elijah or Elijah? Anyway, eh? Elijah. Well, he go, he's, he's, he's going to be arrested. He said there were 50 captains that came up to arrest him. With one captain, sorry, and 50 army people. And he said, when, he, when they came to arrest him, he called down fire from heaven. And they were all burnt and destroyed. And then another group came, and the same happened to them. And if, I think the third group came up that uh, the captain begged for his life to the prophets. 
So there is actually a fire. And we know there's a fire because the disciples, when, the, when Jesus and the disciples went through Samaria, Jesus wasn't received at that time. And, and the disciples said, shall we call down fire from heaven? Jesus said, no, you're of the wrong spirit. Now we're in the New Testament, all right? <laughs> you're of the wrong spirit. And uh, actually, good job they didn't call down fire from heaven to destroy the Samaritans because we know later the Samaritan woman got saved by the love and by the ministry of Jesus Christ at the Samaritan well in Samaria. Amen. So there is a fire of judgment. There is a fire that, that will come down from heaven and judge certain instances and certain people. It said the devil will be thrown into the lake of fire and be tormented day and night forever and ever. If you take the um, 666, 6 is the number of man. Yep, 7 is the number of perfection. 12 is the number of governments. 3 is the number of trinity and so on. So you've got 6 being man. So you've got 666, you've got 3 men. 3 possibly political figures that will be demonized. They won't be demons, but they will be demonized. And so you actually have the Antichrist, you have the beast, and you have the false prophets. 666. Six, six. And he said, in this time, they will be taken and they will be cast into the lake of fire. Which means that there is a lake of fire somewhere. It means there is an existence of a lake of fire. And actually, when we're very understanding about this subject, those who do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, those who have not repented of their sins and followed Jesus Christ, they will be actually cast into the lake of fire as well, along with the Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet and be tormented day and night forever and ever. You can preach that in Africa, people, people stand on their seats and cheer and, and go on alarmingly because they want to hear the truth about that subject. In the West, nobody really wants to talk about hell. It's just like when you go for a funeral and you don't sit, like in, in, in Africa or Asia, you see they have open coffin in the, in the front room. Nobody wants to see coffin here. I just went to the funeral last time and... Uh, they don't even press the button now to send the coffin back into, into, the, into the furnace. That's all done after you've gone now. Sanitized. We don't want to sanitize religion in that, in that sense. Now, if we come to, and I'm jumping ahead of myself, but if we come to the, the fire that comes on sacrifice, I've got scriptures and I've got things, but let me just make a comment where the fire came on the sacrifice. The sacrifice is burnt offerings. The, these are things which were subscribed in the Old Testament that the Jews did. And when they actually offered sacrifice, there are instances where the fire came on the sacrifice and burnt it up. To me, significant, because I'm thinking that I want to talk to you about Jesus in this sense. The Bible says this, Jesus, talking about Jesus, he who knew no sin, became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. The word righteous means blameless. The word righteous means right standing with God. That means that Jesus, the sacrifice, the once for all sacrifice for all of humanity, must have taken that fire at the cross. That fire of judgment must have been taken by Jesus so that those who actually receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, they are no longer going to receive the fire of judgment. There is no judgment, the Bible says. Therefore, there is no judgment or condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 8, 1. When we're talking about judgment for the Christian... You see, we talk for the non-Christian is called the white throne judgment. Every person in the grave, every person buried in the sea, every person that's ever lived will come before the white throne judgments where God 
will be the judge. And where he will read back, it will be read back to them every word they've said in their lives, every action that they've done in their lives. It will actually, I don't know what kind of um, technology the Lord has in heaven, but everything that has ever been said will be read back to them. Every judgment will be a justified judgment. God cannot do any unjust thing. If God casts somebody into the lake of fire, it's only because they deserve to be there. God is not unjust. Hitler deserves to be there. And so on. So you've got, though, no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. What kind of judgment we have is called the Bema Seat Judgment. The Bema Seat Judgment in the Bible is a judgment for rewards. It's not a judgment for sin. Okay? It's a judgment for what we as Christians have done. We get a, a big reward. We get a, um, a medium reward or a small reward. But the Bible says even there we can be saved if we haven't been building with the right things, if we've been building with wood, hay and stubble and not building the, in the right way that God gave to us. He said we'll still be saved, saved but through fire. All right, so that means that there isn't a judgment for those who actually are trusting in Jesus Christ. That judgment for sin has been taken by Jesus. Jesus took our punishment. He took our sin. And I praise God, he took mine and he took yours. And we are now free. Okay, but we're looking here in this judgment. Um, in the New Testament, Paul uh, describes the second coming of Christ as in blazing fire. In 2 Thessalonians 1.7, it said, an appearance that carries overtones of judgment as well as mere presence. Also akin to the Old Testament, Testament imagery is John's vision of Jesus with eyes that are like blazing fire. Again, in judgment contexts. It's not always possible to distinguish the presence of God from His glory. For indeed, glory is frequently a figure itself for divine presence. However, a number of passages focus on fire as synonymous with or in association with God's glory. We all want God's glory. Isn't that right? We all want God's glory, or at least most of us do. But you, you, you're associating glory with fire, according to some of the Scriptures um, that, that are in the Old and New Testaments. Amen. In visions of God in His glory, in both Old and New Testaments, fire is a regular phenomenon. Amen. A special use of fire imagery in the New Testament is that connected with the baptism with fire. John the Baptist predicted that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, I want to... Um, in, in, a, in a way, separate that to my point number two. And I want to talk to you now, I want to move on from judgment. There's much more I can say about judgment. At the end of the age, the world we know is not going to go on forever. The world we know today is not going to continue in the, in the sin and in the greed, and in the selfishness, and all, all the pride that exists. It is going to come to a point of judgment. In the Old Testament, it said about iniquity. And iniquity is not like sin, sin missing the mark. Iniquity is where generations have continued to sin. So where, where Israel went in to take the promised land at that time in the past, it said the sin had become full. It talks about the iniquity of the nations and the people living in those nations had become. It reached its full point and it was now ripe for judgment. So actually Israel were being used as a tool of judgment in that context when they took back or took over the promised land at the promise of God. Okay, so where this world becomes ripe for judgment, 
is where there is found iniquity that goes from generation to generation to generation to generation until it reach, reaches a fullness where God is forced, really, to judge. And that's coming, that will happen, potentially, can happen in our generation, in our time. It's going that way. Okay, so we're looking at point number two, and I um, want to touch this now, which is the fire of cleansing. And I want to, um, to look at this one. The fire of cleansing is very, very interesting. This is my main point today. I indeed baptize you in water because of repentance, that is because of your change, changing your minds for the better, heartily amending your ways with abhorrence of your past sin. But he who's coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy or fit to take off or carry. Very interesting, that scripture. I didn't know Bible at all when I got saved. I was streetwise. And when I went in the church and got saved, I went, the pastor prayed for me afterwards, and I said, I'm not worthy to untie Jesus' shoe, shoelaces. You know, I'm not worthy to... <laughs> it was really weird, and I didn't know Bible. And he said, anyone who comes to Jesus, he will not turn away. Okay, so he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Let's have a look at that. When the, de when the time for Pentecost was fulfilled... They were all in one place together, and suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. Then there appeared to them tongues as of fire, which parted and came to rest on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. Okay, we, we have a situation the disciples, there's, there's 120 of them in the upper room. Jesus' mother would be there. Mary would be there. The, uh, the uh, 12 apostles or the 11 apostles, should say, would be there. Of course, they chose the 12th one, so there would be 12. And there were 120 disciples in the upper room. When they went into the room, they were full of fear. When they went to Jerusalem to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit, they were full of fear. They were afraid to the point where they deserted Jesus when he was arrested to be crucified. Even though Peter said he wouldn't, he denied Jesus three times and he deserted Jesus. Every one of them deserted Jesus Christ. They were afraid for their lives. Now they're going to go, Jesus said, go and wait or tarry in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father comes. That's the promise of the Holy Spirit. I've always associated the baptism or the power of the Holy Spirit with their change of heart, their change of behavior. They came out of the upper room after the Holy Spirit came and they were bold. They were no longer afraid. They were not ever afraid for their lives again. There was a tremendous transformation that took place between going into the upper room and coming out of the upper room. And I've always associated, and I've preached that it's the power of the Holy Spirit, and of course it is. But when we're looking in there, it says that it's to do with the power of the Holy Spirit and also the fire of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's even very, very interesting. So now we have a fire, and Jesus said that he's going to cleanse <laughs> with this fire. He's going to burn the chaff. He's going to burn up the rubbish. I wonder if I could draw the conclusion that fear is a hindrance to the disciples that got burnt up in the upper room, potentially. Something changed. Something happened to them. Where they were actually, if you like, Peter a betrayer, the disciples, fearful, scared, locked the door of the upper room, now coming out boldly. And it doesn't say they ever locked themselves away. Even when they got beaten by rods, even when they got persecuted, the Bible says that they were still bold. The Bible says that they were not fearful anymore. They actually spoke to the leaders 
of the, of the um, scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, in the way now that John the Baptist was spoke to them, confronted them. They were no longer, no longer afraid. I know somebody who, who was one of my spiritual parents who used to be quite timid. And then she got baptized in the Holy Spirit and became very bold. I've seen the actual change that can occur in an individual's life. So what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. Okay, the Spirit of Jesus comes to live inside of you, gives you status, gives you position, gives you forgiveness, makes you into a son, a daughter, a princess, a prince. That's all secured in salvation. But where there comes this power, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, this is an anointing that comes upon us. And the Bible says in Acts 1.8, it said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Why are they witnessing in Dublin? Why are they witnessing in Foxton? And then they were witnessing in Ashford. Why are they witnessing? Because the Holy Spirit has come upon them. They have an understanding of the Bible to go. And the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you find yourself becoming bold. You find yourself losing the timidity. Amen? So there's the power. How much power have you got? There's the power of the Holy Spirit. Who needs the power to live the life in this dangerous world? Who needs the help of God to get through? Every day can be a challenge for some people. We need in this time more than ever before the power of God. Now let's look at the fire. What will the fire do? Has anybody ever asked for the power of the Holy Spirit to come? Has anybody gone further and asked for the baptism of fire? He said a tongue of fire came and sat on their heads, 120 individually, fire on each one. Not fire corporately, this one, fire sitting on each one of them. This was something that God was doing individually for all of them, one by one. And then they began to manifest the gifts after the fire came. Now, would we be able to ask God for the fire? Bearing in mind, we're asking God to burn up things from our hearts that may not be loving. We're asking God to burn up the fear. We're asking God to burn up the impatience. We're asking God to burn up, you know, when you get saved, first thing that goes is the gross stuff. As you progress, what goes next is the why we do what we do. I mean, that's our motivation stuff. Our motivation can, we can do the right things, but with the wrong motivation. So when God comes, he begins to point the finger and say, hey, you're not doing that for the right reason. You're buttering that person up to get something out of them. In other words, you're being nice to them so that you can get something. So your, your motivation now comes under scrutiny. How many of us would like to have a good, pure motivation in everything we do? What about the motivation where it comes to money? Having the right motivation. You know, if you can think about that in the sense that Joseph was a distributor. In the time of famine, in the time when the uh, nation of Egypt and the nation of Israel and other surrounding nations were going through a famine, Joseph, with the wisdom of God, he had granaries. And he became a distributor. 
You see, we can either be consumers or we can be distributors. If you're actually living as a, con- as a consumer, you won't find much generally comes to you because you're actually taking the seed of God and using it as quickly as you get it. If you have a mindset change and that consumerism gets burnt out of the heart and you become a distributor, God will make sure he fills up your house. He will make sure he fills up your, 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 your barn or your granary. He will make sure. I've seen it with my mum. I've seen a stingy dad who didn't get anything given to him, and I've seen a generous mum who got everything given to her. And she always gave it away. She was like, Father Christmas. I'm not kidding. If we have the mindset of generosity, and not the fear that goes with hoarding, not the fear, you know, that goes with just... Sometimes they say it's the fear of poverty, isn't it? The fear of loss, the fear of lack. Okay, we're going to pray soon, but the fire of the Holy Spirit coming to cleanse us. And let me touch the third one as well, couple it with this one. What about the fire of the Holy Spirit for the ministers of God? Let's just have a look at that if I can get back in my... Oh, it's clicked out. So, okay, bear with me. Just simply, I've got a couple of scriptures on this, and uh, yeah, okay. The fire of the Holy Spirit, and um, just want to have a look at that. Okay, fire for the ministers of God. Psalm 104. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, he makes the clouds his chariot. He walks upon the wings of the wind. He makes the wind his messengers, flaming fire his ministers. He established the earth upon its foundation so that it would not totter forever and ever. And Hebrews 1, 7, of the angels, he said, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame, a fiery flame. And uh, over the angels, he said, he makes his angels winds and his, and his ministers a flame fire. Now, of course, the ministers of God are the angels too, aren't they? There is a fire that if we've got it, we can give it away. John Wesley, the revivalist, who used to pray. He said, Lord, set me on fire so people can watch me burn. And what a great man of God John Wesley was. He said, set me on fire so people can watch me burn. John Wesley was the kind of man, if he went back, you read in his journals, and he wasn't persecuted that day for preaching the gospel because he used to preach out in the open. He actually preached where I worked one time in Kennington. In Kennington Park, he preached to 50,000 people in the past history. Of, of, uh, of England and London, that around about, yeah, anyway, he preached. So, where he preached? With fire, he got persecuted. And he said, if he went back home and he wa- hadn't been persecuted, he thought, drew the conclusion, right or wrongly, that he had done something wrong. <laughs> John Wesley, in his journals. We're going to pray now. Now, the power and the fire of the Holy Spirit. Would you like to stand? If you're able to stand. I'm looking into something where it talks about Jerusalem in in the book of Isaiah, and it talks about the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning Coming upon Jerusalem, which is a, in a, in a, in according to Isaiah, is in a terrible, terrible condition. And it talks about them coming to know Jesus in one day. That's Zechariah chapter 12 as well. The spirit of judgment and the spirit of fire. I'm, I'm reasonably comfortable with the, with the fire aspect. I'm studying out and checking out with God about the judgment aspect. And I think that's right. But where, we, where we're looking really, 
we see something coming in the earth where there is in Jerusalem a spirit of judgment and a spirit of fire. And he said, Israel turns to the Lord with repentance. And the whole of Jerusalem is being cleansed. Therefore, if we have the fire, we're able to dispense and give the fire. We become distributors for the kingdom of God. So now we're going to pray and ask God for something. But before we do, sometimes this is the only way. I say, if you're addicted to something, and I've been addicted to things, I was addicted to drugs before. I was addicted to, to, um, to impurity, to lust and all the sexual stuff. I was addicted to that in the past. So other addictions, addicted to different things like anger. Running my family was just with me all the time. We want God to come and burn out those kind of things that stop us walking with Jesus Christ and stop us being fruitful, stop us being peaceful, stop us being joyful, that cause us to be depressed. The only way you get rid of addiction is by recognizing you've got it, not making excuse for it. Anybody who justifies their addiction won't get set free from their addiction. You have to actually say to God, it's true, I need help, and I repent. And then you have to renounce. We, renounce means I have nothing more to do with you. And then we're asking God from that point to come and to then burn it out. Could be anxiety. Some people just live. They, they're champion warriors. They're not warriors. They're warriors. Champion warriors. And don't see that worrying is actually a sin because it's a lack of trust in God. And as I said earlier, fear. What is it that perhaps we need to actually ask God to forgive us, renounce and ask the Holy Spirit to come with power and fire, to burn it up and to make us ministers of fire? Take a moment, be, be before the Lord. Jesus said, don't judge. With the judgment you give will be the judgment returned to you. Amazing. Some people set themselves up as judge, jury, and executioner. That's God's, God's job, not yours, not mine. Let God burn it up. As perhaps you ask God to forgive you for something and you renounce it, now receive the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. Receive forgiveness. It's very easy. It's very quick. And you receive it and you walk in the good of it. But we move from there now. We go in to ask the Holy Spirit to come. We're going to ask Jesus, the baptizer of the Holy Spirit and fire, to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Would you do that yourself? It is an individual thing, as well as a corporate thing. Would you just ask the Lord to baptize you with power? Would you ask him to baptize you with fire? And would you ask him to burn up the dross, burn up the rubbish, burn up the stuff that's not helping you?
Lord Jesus, we ask you to baptize us with the Holy Spirit's power and to baptize us with the fire. We ask you to burn out the dross and the rubbish and cleanse us. And may our lives come forth as pure wheat, as something beautiful in your hand. Come Holy Spirit and burn out those judgments. May the Holy Spirit come upon you. If you know Jesus, may the Holy Spirit empower you. And from today, may the Holy Spirit release that fire into our hearts, into our lives to burn up the rubbish. Just while you're praying and while your heads are bowed and, uh, and eyes are closed as well, just want to ask, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, the Bible says that um, you're still under judgment. And really that is not the place to be because you want to know the Jesus who took your judgments, took your punishments, and you want to be set free, which is for eternity, by the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. And I want to ask you, if there's anybody who will pray with me to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and this one means that you're making sure that you will go to heaven when you die. You're making sure your sins are forgiven and you're making sure that Jesus lives in your heart. And you're making sure then that you're going to build a relationship with him. I'm going to pray a prayer. You pray this in your heart. Lord Jesus, I come to you as I am. I ask you to forgive me because I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, I open the door of my heart and I welcome you to come in and be my Savior and my Lord from this moment on. I give my life to you to serve you and to bring glory to your name. If you prayed that with me, would you just like to wave to me? You prayed that prayer with me, okay? Just lift up your hand quickly. I'm not going to call you out. I'm just going to pray for you. Say, I want to follow Jesus from this moment. And I want to pass from judgment into freedom, into life. Just wave to me. Lift up your hand quickly. Okay, I'm just going to leave it there. Father, I pray for Aaron. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ for others that your Holy Spirit will come upon them and you will lead and direct them into freedom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching our service. If you'd like to watch last week's service, click over here. And don't forget to subscribe. God bless you.